Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD bodybuilder, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today, I'm joined again by the one and only Eric Helms, and we are back with another foundational episode where we'll be diving further into the nutrition side of bodybuilding. Today, we'll be getting into fundamentals in terms of determining your calorie intake and macros for bulking and optimal muscle growth. Thanks for being on the show, Eric. Always a pleasure, Bill. Thanks for having me. So yeah, building off of our previous discussions, I think we'll basically just be building this up from the ground up and starting, you know, from the basics, which would be calories. And I think one of the, you know, initial questions that you'll ask when you're setting up your diet plan is how to figure out maintenance calories. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I think, uh, so the idea here, if we're, if we're trying to grow muscle, typically you want to be in a surplus. You don't necessarily have to be in a surplus, which we, we could talk about, but that can easily tangent into a, a whole discussion of body recomposition if you want. Um, but most of the time we're talking about setting up some size of surplus, and I'm sure we will talk about what's an appropriate size surplus eventually, but the it begs the question of, well, how do I know if I'm even in a surplus? Hmm. Um, so you had to have to know where you are currently. And typically what I have people do is just track their nutrition, uh, for at least two weeks, three weeks, sometimes a little better. And this is a great opportunity to learn the skills of tracking, um, seeing what you eat, what your habits are, uh, which can give you clues as to what might be things you could improve or optimize, um, and learn some of the basic skills of like, how do you use a food scale? Uh, how do I better estimate, uh, when I, when I go out to eat, when I'm in a coaching position, obviously I can facilitate that learning. Um, you know, I can do basically food recalls with them and, you know, discuss and plan ahead of time and see where they might've made an error, help them understand whatever nutrition tracking app they're using and where there might be mistakes. Cause it's a you know, database where users contribute to it or what have you or whatever. But, um, ultimately what I'm looking at is their average change in morning weight, um, taken from at least three measurements a week, uh, over those two to three weeks where we're also tracking data and then just seeing if they're already in a slight surplus, slight deficit, uh, or if they're right around maintenance. Um, and most people will already have a decent idea of some of these things, you know, um, they'll, they'll at the very least know if they have been gaining or losing weight. Um, but they may or may not, I mean, it's not uncommon for people to just be like, yeah, I try to eat a high protein diet and that's about it. And then you can ask them, all right, so what's your weight done for the last month? You know, and if they're tracking the data, great, or it's just kind of a, they're kind of qualitative remembering of the times they stepped on the scale. Most people are typically somewhere around maintenance by default, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, or they might've been just doing kind of a, an aggressive bulk without really tracking. Like I just, you know, kind of on the seafood diet and maybe they want to do it more efficiently this time, but nonetheless, uh, that's the process for figuring out maintenance. If someone has gained, you know, a pound over the last three weeks, you can roughly extrapolate, okay, that means they've been on a, on a, on a net surplus of 500 kcals per day over those three weeks. So it's only like 150 calories, 160 calories, 170 calories per day on average surplus. Um, and then you would just take their, their average calories and take roughly, you know, 150 to 200 away from that. And you've got a rough maintenance figure that you can work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I really like that. I have the same kind of approach. I think that a lot of people will kind of talk about these online calculators for figuring out their, you know, TD and stuff. And I just think that actually looking at your scale weight is, uh, you know, ultimately the gold standard because we're looking for what's what amount of calories will actually maintain your weight. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good kind of approach. And I think it's important for people to have an understanding of where their maintenance calories are around because they'll, you'll want to be coming back to this kind of number whenever you're deciding to bulk or cut. Yeah. A couple, couple things to add to that is it's also really important people to remember that it's not a static figure, your maintenance changes. Um, you know, the, and, and if you think about the span of caloric intake that you might have in a competitive bodybuilder mm -hmm. from the highest intake you'll have in the off season to the lowest it might be during a challenging digging phase and contest prep, mm -hmm. You could have the same competitor who's on 1800 calories in a hard phase of prep or 4,000 calories in the off season. So 
that that can be tough for people to wrap their head around and you know they'll, they'll throw things out like metabolic damage or something going on like what's happening and it's really the difference from being in a 500 calorie surplus you know 20 pounds heavier versus being in a 500 calorie deficit 20 pounds lighter you know yeah. or more right um and so that is wrapped up also with a little bit of the adaptive nature of energy expenditure. When you are trying to gain weight and you are already at a point where your body uh, is starting to defend against weight gain, um, you know, we often talk about like set point or settling point. What we're really talking about is what's called the dual intervention model is that there's some point for each person at a higher body weight and a lower body weight where their body to whatever degree for them intervenes and does some things to down or upregulate energy expenditure. Mm. And typically humans are much better at uh, downregulating energy expenditure than upregulating it, unless you just happen to be one of those people with a very spendthrift metabolism. And most of this comes through changes in non-exercise activity thermogenesis with smaller changes to basal metabolic rate from actual true physiological changes that don't just affect behavior, um, but are actually changing things like core temperature, uh, thyroid output, adrenaline release, um, sex hormone production, the whole nine yards, uh, which can have consequences in the actual output. So you may be someone who can maintain your weight in a plus or minus 300 calorie range. And you might have to increase your calories from current maintenance by say 700 to get into a 500 calorie surplus. So that is a, that's a thing. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you gain weight, that could change as if you try to you bulk in a leaner state, that might be different as well. So it, this, this, this isn't just like a number that will always be you. You get a new job, you know, you have kids, you, you know, move, all these things can impact, uh, your, your output. So things to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that people kind of run into these issues sometimes, especially like when they're transitioning out of a fat loss phase, for example, when they're just like, Oh, I'm done with the fat loss phase. Let's just jump back to quote maintenance. And then they <laughs> end up gaining weight on that because their maintenance has changed because you lose a lot of weight and you are now just a lighter person. And, uh, there is quite a bit of that, uh, change in neat as well. Funny thing, <laughs> funny story is that like, I like, as we were talking about off air, I'm on, I'm like two days out in prep right now. And, um, it's been crazy seeing like my, my neat going down and, you know, just leaning against walls and things. This is the thing I mm -hmm. call. So this is the thing in medicine we call the shopping cart sign where it's like, when people have spinal stenosis, they will tend to lean over their shopping cart because the, uh, it relieves some of the compression in their spinal canal. And, uh, I like noticed myself in the grocery store, like leaning over my shopping cart because I'm like so exhausted. I'm just like, Oh, oh yeah. shopping cart sign. Yeah. Cardio becomes more and more you like sleeping on, on, on whatever <laughs> the thing you're on with yeah. your upper body and your legs just kind of doing this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, don't lean on it. Don't lean on mm -hmm. it. Yep. So anyways, yeah. Now that we've covered maintenance calories. So once, yeah, I think we'll probably, park the body recomp discussion for now. And I think focus on someone who wants to bulk or be in a more of a calorie surplus in terms of the next step, then people will want to figure out their overall calorie intake, like the, the, the amount of surplus. So how should they go about that? Yeah, I think generally the best way to do it is to work backwards. And that is, um, we have some limited data and I have some, you know, we have anecdotal experience as well and this is coming from a natural bodybuilding coach, mind you, as to what's a reasonable rate of weight gain that doesn't result in rapid accumulation of body fat, which then kind of forces you to take more frequent mini cuts, which then ends up becoming this tortoise versus the hare scenario. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the hare. He, he loses the race in that parable. If you haven't <laughs> paid attention to your nursery rhymes, um, which is critical for bodybuilders. You got to know your nursery rhymes. So <laughs> Roughly the, the, the fastest rate I would suggest someone gaining weight is about 2% of your body weight per month. Mm. Okay. So that's not that fast. When you think about it on a week to week basis, we're talking about 0.5% uh, of your body weight per week. So if you are a 200 pound person, just to keep the math simple, you could at fastest gain about a pound a week, but that is a, a speed that I would normally relegate to folks who are 
relatively early um, in their in their career. They have not built the majority of their muscle yet. They are is, is still in the newbie phase where they can make those rapid gains. Um, so if you know someone was like, "Hey, I've been lifting for a month, and I'm thinking about getting into this bodybuilding thing," you know, not necessarily competitively, if they've just been lifting for a month, but you know, putting on as much mass as possible, that's the situation where I would do that. Um, in other cases, I would scale that uh, to the individual somewhere between like 0.5 to 1.5 percent of body weight per month, um, which is which is slow. You know, most of the time, what we're talking about there, depending on the person's size, is like a 100 to 300 calorie surplus, which you know. I think people typically, if they haven't read much in this space about, you know, what's a reasonable rate, uh, or if they follow folks who are on the enhanced side or just like kind of the general fitness articles, um, they kind of use the same rates they do for fat loss, like, Oh, lose a pound a week, gain a pound a week. And unfortunately it just takes a lot more time uh, and effort to, to build muscle than it does to lose fat. Uh, and, it just kind of, there's a, there's a rate limit to how quickly you can go without accumulating excess, uh, body fat. And sometimes you may not care about that. Like if, if you're just trying to get as big as possible and you don't care, like just get huge. Like if you're maybe a power lifter or a football player, mm -hmm. uh, and you're happy to move up a weight class or what have you, but most of the time a competitive bodybuilder wants to be a little more conservative because it eventually has to come off. You know, if you put on an additional 10 pounds of fat in your off season that you could have avoided, that's potentially adding, you know, five to 10 weeks to a contest prep diet, which could potentially result in you losing additional muscle mass and, and negating any benefit you had from being more aggressive in that surplus during the off season. So that's kind of the calculus that you have to consider. Um, and so, yeah, generally you can use the same math. Uh, even though it doesn't add up perfectly that you would use for, Hey, there's roughly 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. Mm -hmm. If you want to kind of do the math for, for muscle, it's, it's similar, but different for, for, for different reasons. And I don't want to get too complex on this, but a pound of fat is adipose tissue, right? Mm -hmm. And we make assumptions about hopefully we'll lose only fat. A pound of muscle is a combination of water and protein, right? Uh, and there's also some glycogen losses. There's, there's, there's more things in there, but it has a much lower energetic value for the same amount of tissue. However, there seems to be an energetic cost associated with building muscle, which is why I was saying you might increase your calories 700, but only find yourself in like a 500 calorie surplus. So when you're actually effectively building muscle, your energy expenditure goes up from the cost of trying to do that. So you often have to increase calories more than you expect. And on top of that, you're dealing with that upper end of that dual intervention model. So when we look at actual rates of weight gain and the, the, the amount of people increase their calories, no, in the real world, we don't actually know your maintenance. Um, we just know how much we increased it while we went on this bulking plan. It ends up working out decently well to, to increase your calories kind of using those same proportions. Um, and that's why that 100 to 300 calorie surplus is probably appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's, it's a decent proxy so long as you kind of know that. And also, you're not just gaining muscle. You're also getting some fat. So to gain a pound it'd be nice at the intermediate, uh, sorry, the late intermediate or advanced stage, even for that to be 50, 50, you know, muscle fat. But, uh, and some people get discouraged when they hear things like that, especially the, the newer folks to lifting. But when you think about it, like, okay, if you gained a pound a month, that's 12 pounds in a year. And if half of it was muscle and half of it was fat, you look substantially different. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the difference between me six pounds heavier and six pounds lighter is the difference in my, for my stage pictures in 2007 versus 2019, mm. you know? So it is a, it is a very, very different physique. Uh, and I used a within person comparison just to make that a little more valid. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tedious process. Uh, you're not, it's not going to be hundred percent lean. Um, and the math can get complicated if you think about that way, but it, we should probably also discuss bill. We don't have to immediately that you don't necessarily have to go by the numbers to do this, um, in terms of calorie intake, you can potentially use, a just mostly just looking at your body weight and following certain behaviors and internal cues to set up what I would argue is just as valid of, a, of an approach to bulking.
Yeah, no, I think that's great. And yeah, we'll absolutely get into that because that's kind of what I follow. But um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Yeah, I like to liken it to when you think about a pound of muscle, think about like a pound of like ground beef at the at the grocery store, you know, like if you put on two pounds, that's like serious size. So and I think that's one of the biggest issues that people go through when they start off bodybuilding, where they, they before you go through your first cut, you assume you like you assume all the weight you, you're putting on is muscle because the, the thing about fat is that it kind of interdigitates with your muscle tissues. So like you look, you're like your arm is like swole, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of it is actually fat and you don't kind of notice that your abs are getting blurry and you don't since it's happening so slowly. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember, and this is especially true for people who are getting into the game who are on the thinner side. Uh, I was like that. I just, I had no conception that I could get like fat, you know, yeah. which, which might sound weird to people who, who didn't have that background, but I went from, you know, like 175 up to 220 in my first two years of lifting. And I had probably gone from 12% nice. to like 20% body fat, you know, and don't get me wrong. That's a lot of muscle, but, um, it wasn't, 45 pounds of muscle, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, like I thought it was, you know, um, actually I'll get all the way up to 26. So we're probably talking, uh, so, I mean, I put on a good amount of muscle I'm six foot, so yeah, yeah. it's, it's nothing, it's nothing crazy, but I remember when I dieted down, I, for my, for the first diet I ever did, I dieted all the way down to like 195. And I thought, cause I was around in my, in it, like it, it, no, I was 220. I thought if I went from 220 to 200, I'd be close to I'd be like 10% yeah. body fat. That's what I thought, you know, I lose 20 pounds. I mean, how, how, have, how fat could I be right now? <laughs> um, and I dieted down to 195. I lost 25 pounds and I was probably back to the level of leanness I was when I started lifting. So it was not 10% body fat. It's more like 12 or 13. And I was like, oh, so I've actually only put on 20 pounds of muscle. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was, it was a, you know, like a bit of a rude awakening. Um, just to, to, to not notice that you put on 20 pounds of body fat, you know, um, now for other people, I think this can be a little more complicated. If you're someone who is higher in body fat than you want to be, um, and you are trying to bulk, that's where people really get stuck, you know? Um, and there's, there's a lot of people who are in that position. They, they would describe themselves. Oh, I'm not a fan of the term. The term is like skinny fat, or they might actually be someone who wants to put on more muscle, but is, you know, 30 pounds over fat, you know? So, so there's someone who is, is aware that they're, they're going to have to cut, but they also have not been training. So the, the calculus for people in either one of those situations is a lot different than it was for you or you or I bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Things to keep into account and yeah like i definitely see things from that that same same perspective where i started off being the the skinny guy trying to bulk up mm -hmm. and then being like oh my goodness i gained 30 pounds of muscle and I'm huge. yeah anyways yeah so yeah we should touch on that more intuitive approach as well i think mm -hmm. that it can be you know a lot of people will always talk about calories and coming back to oh how many calories do i need to eat but ultimately you can do these things through a very intuitive approach as well and I'm a big fan of sustainability and trying to do things off of the least invasive approach. And you can get a lot of information just by you know, looking at your scale weight and going off of hunger cues. So how would you recommend that? It's a great lead in. So I think um, ultimately, I know sometimes people who are more quantitative or analytical in their mindset and want to be quote unquote more optimal, they tend to have a natural pushback against what I'm going to recommend, but it is the same thing when it really comes down to it, right? The, the way we're figuring out where maintenance is, is based on scale weight change. The way that we're figuring out what a deficit is, is scale weight change. The way that we figure out how, how large our surplus is, is, is scale weight change. And then we're making extrapolations based upon that. So it kind of begs the question, well, if we're simply trying to get a certain rate of scale weight change that's appropriate for my level of experience and my individual uh, genetics, then why don't I just pay attention to that? Do I need to actually count my calories to eat more or eat less? And the answer is no, you, you don't. Um, and the level of fidelity and control that you need to have with your intake maybe isn't that high because we also don't have knowledge of our energy expenditure. We're dealing with, is this is algebra, right? Mm. We know the input with some error and we know the output 
but we don't know that third factor. So we know energy intake and we know change in scale weight, but we don't know why. You know, we're solving for why here, which is energy expenditure, uh, which is, is, is the difference, right? So the size of the surplus is, is, is the piece I'm talking about. And it sort of doesn't matter what your actual energy intake is if you're reaching the appropriate target rate of weight gain. So the way you work around this is you go, okay, you know, based upon these values, I'm going to go for a 1% change in body weight per month. I'm going to work off of a two week average. Uh, and so therefore I'm trying to gain, uh, let's say two pounds a month, you know, so for every two weeks, I'm trying to gain one pound. So I'm looking at, you know, these two week averages and trying to see roughly a pound change. Mm -hmm. So when I'm falling outside of say gaining 0.7 to 1.3 pounds, I try to be a little more or less full respectively. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so what you can do, like you were saying is, is kind of give yourself satiety ratings after meals, you know, how full am I on a scale of one to 10 or one to five. And if you notice you're hanging around, say a, uh, on a one to 10 scale, let's say in the, the four to six range is where you tend to just have the same weight, then you need to be a, at a fullness of say seven to eight after each meal. And that will probably put you into surplus if you don't, you know, change the types of food you're eating and then, you know, see, see what rate you, you go at. So essentially what you do is you just set up the behaviors that would support bodybuilding. So you have at least, you know, three meals a day, maybe more, because it's kind of hard to get into a surplus, just eating three meals per day, unless you're relatively small and just tend to have, uh, you know, a good hunger signal generally. Uh, and each time you're having a decent serving of protein, uh, you're having a source of carbs, a source of fat, and you might be adding snacks in here and there where you can stomach them to reach a certain rate of weight gain. So you're basically using biofeedback scale weight to influence your, your, your qualitative behaviors around eating, but using a structure that supports, uh, bulking and you can get everything optimized. You know, if you're eating enough protein, you really don't get extra credit for being at, you know, more than two grams per kg or, or making sure that you had, you know, 35 instead of 38 grams of protein and tracking that in one meal. So long as you had sufficient throughout the day, you know, you sandwich two of those around training and you, and you, you've covered all your bases that we theoretically think matter. So you can absolutely do this without tracking the upside to tracking speaking to the actual competitors out there is that the you know, you start walking a narrower and narrower path where there's consequences to eating too little or too much. Um, and you can rely less on your hunger and satiety signals when they start to become more homo homogenous during prep. And that homogeneity is you're always hungry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to tell at a certain point. Um, and unless you're highly experienced, I'd recommend probably tracking, uh, at least calories and protein during prep. So you might not know where to start if you, uh, you know, if when you transition from, from off season to in season, so it wouldn't be a bad idea to just get back into the habit of tracking and do some audits and figure out where you're at as you approach prep. But let's say, you know, we've got a two year off season plan. There's nothing wrong with, you know, a year and 10 months of that to be untracked, uh, and just be, to be using these, these, these cues and, uh, just looking at, uh, your scale weight and making adjustments from there in a more qualitative uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Really well said. I think that I have the same views in that, you know, scale weight is ultimately the metric that we're using to guide things. And it's, it's ultimately like the, the, the only like hard, hard marker that we have ultimately. So I like when people talk about calories, I, I will really lean towards having people guide things off their scale weight. So when people ask, Oh, how many calories of surplus? I'd say like, I'd rather you think about things in terms of rate of weight gain, because that's going mm -hmm. to be a more applicable measure in the end. Yep. hundred percent agree. And there's, and there's ways to even individualize this more and more over time. So, you know, like you might think, okay, I'm trying to target a 1% rate of, of weight gain because Eric said so. Uh, and then these amount of calories, and hit go. Um, but if we want to individualize that, we should be trying to figure out what's the rate of weight gain appropriate for me, you know, and other things that we should be looking at things that I look at as a coach are, are we seeing relatively steady progress across the majority of lifts in terms of loads going up, uh, reps going up, uh, you know, if those two things stay the same, it should be getting easier you know, so that you could increase load or, or reps. And so your, your proximity to failure is, is increasing, right? 
Um, and so in addition to gym progress, scale weight change, there should also be semi-regular visual, visual assessments. Um, you know, if you're really experienced, this might be just a couple times a year where you actually formally take pictures in the same, uh, lighting in the same clothing and relatively similar acute conditions of, you know, hydration, meal timing, time of day, um, proximity to a workout. But if you're maybe you know, intermediate or earlier, this could be every two to three months, you know, to get those, those same conditions for a picture. Mm -hmm. And it should, it should tell you like, okay, how rapidly am I accumulating body fat? Um, don't expect yourself to look better from picture to picture, by the way, it's it sometimes just trying to mitigate the damage. You know, the main things I do focus on are performance and, and rate of scale weight change and not getting too fat is basically what it looks like in an advanced person. Cause you yeah. really don't know if you've made progress, um, until you have a lot of time between like the kind of calculus that sometimes goes through my head is okay. Last time I was at this weight, was I leaner than this? Or was, am I leaner now? Sometimes I can be like, actually, I'm, this is the best I've looked at 210 or something like that. Um, and, uh, so over the years I've noticed like, oh, I can walk around at 210 and look pretty good. But I remember, oh, like in 2008, if I walked around at 210, I looked kind of chunky, like, okay, I've made some progress, you know, <laughs> of course it's like a, a 10 year time span that I'm talking about, but, um, but it, it just unfortunately changes when you're a, a drug-free advanced lifter um, who doesn't necessarily have, you know, like stellar genetics to like, I, I compete at, you know, 180. I don't compete at, but other six foot, you know, to, like a top tier natural pro is six foot is competing 200 pounds or heavier in some cases. So that ain't me. So I, I with, with a smaller total change in body mass, that means I'm looking at more minute changes, right? So the measurement error needs to be lower, which means I put my faith in, in, in things I'm more confident of. And uh, I look for, for slower changes overall. So those are all things that need to be considered. Um, and so you, that you can take those kind of, Hey, you're probably should be in this ballpark and individualize it. Um, or, or you might just be kind of repeating that same process of, of gaining body fat too quickly. And maybe you need to take it slower, something like that. Yeah. It's helpful for, for people to understand the context. I think of as naturals become more advanced, the rate of gain is actually really slow. <laughs> And as you said, it can sometimes take you, you know, years or even between contest prep, say for people to see what actually happened. So, yeah, yeah. I think starting to delve a little deeper, we could start, we crack the, the chest of macros. So mm -hmm. this is everyone's favorite topic. Uh, I think starting off with protein would be prudent. So yeah, start kick us off, Eric, in terms of, I guess, in general, how much protein we should, should we be having? Yeah, no, we've got actually a fairly robust amount of data on, you know, what intake of protein, where, where do we stop getting benefits from higher protein intakes? Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, the first thing we should say is that protein is the most important macronutrient building muscle, but it's also generally overrated when it's talked about. Um, and to give people an idea of, of why I say that, um, yes, a higher protein diet is better. Like in terms of science, it's statistically significant and it has a non-trivial effect size to eat higher versus lower when it's meta-analyzed, but the effect is small. We're talking about a small effect size. If we had a scale from trivial to small, to moderate, to large, um, protein has a similar effect, you know, uh, as creatine. So a supplement, you know, when we look at it, Damn. but it, it's, it's, it's like, when we just look at the raw effect sizes, but it's something that, that, that kind of matters all the time, you know? So the, like, if you were to look at the research on protein, if we took every study out there and we did this in 2018, uh, Morton led a great uh, meta-analysis on, uh, on protein intakes to optimize gains and lean, lean body mass and strength. Uh, we try to try to figure out what the break point is, is when do you start to see that the values mm -hmm. plateau when you compare higher to lower proteins and then, you know, how often are these, and what are the individual characteristics of these studies? Like if you took all the studies that asked this research question, uh, how much protein is better than, than another amount of protein to enhance strength or lean mass, maybe 70% of them are like no significant difference between groups. And that's not to say that it doesn't matter. It's just to say that in the types of studies we do in sports science, we're talking about small sample sizes. So that means you need large, there's, there's a, 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 always a solid relationship in research where if you're trying to observe a smaller effect, 
you need a larger sample and or a longer period of time to observe it. So if you have an eight week study with 10 people per group, that's a low sample size, relatively short term for the variables we're interested in. There's a high probability that you're the error that, uh, that you're going to have in trying to assess that is greater than the change. So if you had a group that's consuming two grams per kg and one group that's consuming one gram per kg, so that's a low versus a high, that's why seven out of 10 times, there's not going to be a difference over that short time period, mm -hmm. right? But most of the time, what you will see is that there's a mean difference favoring the higher protein group, but it's not significant. There's too much variability. So when you meta-analyze that, you're, you're, you're getting that thing you wanted, a higher sample. So now we've got 15 of these studies. And now while only three of them showed significant effects favoring higher protein, the overall meta-analysis meta meta of that data shows, yes, there is a significant difference favoring higher protein intakes. And we can see it's there, but it's small. So protein matters, uh, and it's better to consume a higher protein diet. And we know the break point, if we were to be conservative, is probably somewhere around 0.7 grams per pound or 1.6 grams per kg. And that's generally the bottom end of what I recommend for, for bodybuilders in the off season. So, uh, all the way up to, you know, a gram per pound and sometimes a little higher than that. If someone's, you know, if you're eating a lot of calories, it's kind of hard to not let your carbs drive that up. Uh, or if you were someone who actually struggles not to gain weight too quickly in the off season, uh, sometimes I think it's worthwhile to use a slightly higher protein intake just to hopefully get some satiety effects. Um, probably even more important is things like, you know, wealth of fruits and vegetables and fiber. I think those probably on a, a, a like a food item versus food item are going to be more satiating than just how, what's the proportion of your diet from protein. But generally I sit in the range of 0.7 to one gram per pound, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kg. Those are the same values to symmetric versus, uh, American. And, um, and then I will scale it up or down based upon is the person struggling to get their food in or is the person struggling not to gain weight too quickly? So uh, if they are struggling not to gain weight too quickly, I'll go towards the higher of that protein. And if they are uh, struggling to gain weight, I will drop the protein a little bit to what the minimum amount that I think is ideal, uh, making more room for carbs and fats and, you know, hopefully having a slightly less high sati satiation effect from that protein. And that's lean body mass. No, nope, that's total body mass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just most of the data and that, that we're, we're operating off of. We're not, we don't have uh, data based on uh, lean body mass. Okay. So yeah, like I guess what kind of body fat percentage ranges are these people at then? Good question. Um, and they're most of the time in what we would consider quote unquote normal body fat ranges. Um, and if you are someone who is very, very high in body fat, uh, you can, uh, a nice little rule of thumb. That's a kind of cool handy trick that seems to work out quite well. And this is something that Andy Morgan, my co-author on one of my co-authors on the muscle and strength pyramids came up with is just your height in centimeters as a, as a target for grams of protein. It worked really well. So for example, I'm six foot to like 184 centimeters, 184, uh, grams of protein for me is like 1.8, 1.9 grams per kg. So, and it, it works for almost everybody. So yeah, no, that, that's a yeah, good one. That one works well. I think that, yeah, that's a good thing to clarify because, um, a lot of people, you know, when they start out they're they're relatively overweight and they're just, and, and they, they complain, oh, I need to get in so much protein. I need like I don't know, 200 yes. plus grams. And I think that's one of the, one of the big scores of the science space community and, you know, fitness is that like, it reassures us that you like, don't need as much as like, mm -hmm. you know, what some bodybuilder bros may tell you. And absolutely you can can have a lot more flexibility. Like it's 0.7. It really isn't that hard to hit mm. in terms of the actual protein sources. Uh, there's a lot of hype about, you know, various amino acids is, uh, yeah. What's the, I guess, you know, validity of any of these, uh, individual, uh, breakdown components. Like, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. And, and you basically get two answers depending on what research you look at. If we were to look at all of the muscle protein synthesis studies, which typically last anywhere from two to 14 hours, and they're looking at the actual kinetics of labeled amino acids. So you use a technique where you actually 
are either assessing a biopsied muscle, which is a newer technique or older techniques where you do an intravenous infusion, uh, where you have labeled uh, isotopes in certain amino acids, and you can see the rate and the location and the amounts that are getting deposited. So you give someone soy protein, whey protein, have a workout, and we look at the, the, the comparison of these curves. Um, that's what I would describe as mechanistic research. So it helps us understand mechanistic differences and mechanisms, but it's just a snapshot. It's not saying, and we looked at then 10 weeks later of continuing that protocol and who had enhanced muscle thickness when we evaluated an ultrasound probe on their quadricep, right? Hmm. So when we look at the mechanistic data, you see a pretty strong relationship with uh, higher quote unquote quality proteins that have a greater preponderance of leucine and the essential amino acids having higher peaks and greater total area under the curve uh, for muscle protein synthesis for the time period studied. However, when you look at long-term data, uh, and by the way, I would also put forth that it's not ubiquitous. There are some weird things that happen in muscle protein synthesis research. And I, I like, and sometimes they, they don't correlate with long-term gains. But anyway, when we look at the, the actual applied studies where we're actually measuring hypertrophy in people who are following a certain dietary pattern or who are supplementing their diet with a type of protein powder, maybe it's uh, lower quality, say a vegan protein powder or a vegan diet or a higher quality, quote unquote, uh, animal-based, uh, you know, dairy-based protein. Mm -hmm. Um all those differences really start to fade away when there's uh, a, a, a uh, adequate protein intake in the range that we've talked about. So, um, yeah. So when you look at studies where say, for example, there's one I can think of people are supplementing with 40 grams of rice or whey protein mm -hmm. on top of their normal diet, which put them well above the kind of the, the, the protein range we were, we were advising no significant differences between groups. Um, when we talk about a vegan diet compared to omnivorous diet, diet, where they're consuming at least that 1.6 gram per kg, a recommendation and eating at least three times per day and training in the fed state, no significant difference between groups. So it probably doesn't matter is, is the, is the answer there. Um, it could matter if we're talking about skirting. And the reason why it probably doesn't matter is that 1.6 grams per kg, it's not this tipping point where if you went to 1.5, your gains fall off a cliff. That's actually the middle from that meta-analysis by Morton and colleagues, the, the mean, uh, our, our best guess at what the average value of that breakpoint is. But if we looked at the, the variability in that, so what we call a confidence interval, like if we have 95% confidence that the mean falls somewhere in this range, it actually goes from one to 2.2. So or what, the reason why I said our conservative recommendation, that's one gram per kg to 2.2 grams per kg. That's a lot of variability. Mm. So the reason I recommend 1.6 to 2.2 is it's the mean up to the upper end of the confidence interval. So it's a safe recommendation. Okay. To, it is possible that the actual breakpoint, if we surveyed every person in the world and put them on an RCT of comparing high versus low protein intake, the dream, the dream <laughs> that it could be one, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5 grams per kg. That's actually where the real true, one true breakpoint is. Um, and with a 95% confidence interval, it's going to be wide because that means we're almost sure it's somewhere in this range. If we were using a 90% confidence interval, then it would come down to being something much tighter. Uh, it's just the nature of the statistics of it. And another reason why I'm, I'm comfortable saying 1.6 to 2.2 is there have been some other meta-analyses that have come out since the Morton one that generally also find this kind of relationship that, that is uh, starting to see similar breakpoints or similar high points or points where it starts to plateau that are you know approaching 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 in that range or giving diminishing returns as you get into the higher protein intake ranges. So I would be really surprised if the true, you know, uh, you know, like maximum benefit from protein was around 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 grams per kg. Um, but anyway, uh, and you also see a, a very proportionate difference. Like, let's say 1.6 is better than 1.5. Are we going to pick that up in an eight-week study comparing, you know, vegans to, to non-vegans? Probably not, mm. you know? So, so generally, I think so long as you're hitting that amount of protein range, you probably don't need to worry about it too much. Um, I would say in general that vegans, specifically vegans, and I'm not saying vegetarians, because that means they're typically lacto-ovo or lacto-ovo. And if you're consuming eggs and dairy, you, you might as well be omnivorous in terms of uh, protein quality. Um, but anyway, if you are a vegan 
um, it wouldn't be a bad idea just to make sure that you do have a fair amount of different complementary protein sources that are from varied places. And if you're using a protein powder, I would normally recommend something that includes pea protein, uh, which it's you know low in, I think, methionine, but it's pretty high in the rest of the essential amino acids and in leucine. Mm. And it'll be very complementary to the typical diet of a vegetarian. And you can get like a, you know, a pea rice blend, which actually has a very similar amino acid profile to, to whey. Um, sometimes it's called the vegan's whey. But anyway, um, with sufficient total protein intake for the day, the protein quality becomes far less important. Um, maybe if you're someone who's actually really struggling and struggling to get that, that, that protein intake, and you're more like in the 1.4 to 1.6 on a day-to-day -day basis, then it would be important to think about what's, what's my protein quality look like. And maybe I should get in, you know, cause I hate eating protein anyway, maybe two of my, my protein serving should be, uh, you know, whey or, or, or vegan's whey or something like that to make sure that the quality is high to offset it being a little low. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that that's a that's a nice solid like rule of thumb, you know, and the how about fast versus slow digesting proteins? Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're largely pretty, pretty misunderstood. Like mm -hmm. if, if you were to ask your average person, like what's a fast digesting protein way, what's a slow digesting protein casein? The funny thing is that when the limited research we have that actually looks at digestion speed and isolation, casein is more accurately described as like the second fastest protein. <laughs> like the only protein that's actually slower than that I'm aware of is whey. Um, but it's actually not that like whey is just remarkably fast. Uh -huh. Um, so you do not need to really think about protein digestion speed because everything is slow compared to whey. It's just, we're so hyper-focused on whey because it's easy to give. And, uh, it's often the supplement co company's main selling thing who are sponsoring the research and providing yeah. the powder, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, it's expensive to give a whole lot of powder to a whole lot of people over, for a time period. So when a, you know, a company is like, Hey, we'll, you know, we'll give you guys a bunch of bag of powder. You're like, great. Okay. We're studying soy and whey, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a disproportionate amount of studies on, on whey protein in, in the research, which makes it look really, really good. And it's not that it's not good, but it's just not that special compared to other proteins. It is fast, but is that relevant? You know? And, and the answer is, is, is probably not, um, I can understand there being a theoretical concern about speed of digestion of protein, because unlike glycogen, which we store as muscle glycogen or unlike body fat, which we store as adipose tissue, and we have storage forms of these things, uh, we don't really have storage forms of protein that are easily metabolizable. I mean, our body's obviously mostly made of protein, but that does mean that we have an ongoing need for protein. Cause it's not like we just break down the tissue in, in, in my quad right now to give me for, for other dietary needs, you know, you'll read a nutrition textbook and it talks about an amino acid pool, but you're like, well, where is that pool? I don't really get it. You know? And so we certainly do, you know, catabolize, uh, lean, lean tissue to, to get, um, protein, but it's not the same thing as liberating triglycerides from adipose tissue or, or, you know, breaking down and creating uh, glucose from glycogen. Um, so, you can definitely make the argument like, yeah, you have to think about your protein needs on a, on a meal to meal basis. And again, when we look at the mechanistic acute snapshot muscle protein synthesis studies, it makes you think that you need to eat, you know, every three hours, you need to have a bolus of protein. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a great study by Arita and colleagues, which is mechanistic. It's a, I think a 14 hour study where they gave people 80 grams of whey protein for, for the day. So that's all they had in this 14 hour period. So again, for one, no other food, okay. came into the lab in the fasted state and then whey protein, the fastest digesting protein. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they found that when you gave people four doses of 20 grams spread apart, like every three hours in the study, they had total greater net muscle protein synthesis, like area under the curve. than when you gave them one big bolus dose of 80 or two smaller doses of 40, the, the four doses of 20 was best. And people will take that and directly apply it to bodybuilding, like application and go, sweet, I eat, you know, every three hours and I'm eating, you know, 30, 40, 50 grams of protein, depending on my body size. But they're forgetting that th those lab conditions are so different than what you do in real life, that they are creating that environment where that could actually be superior. Yeah. Because A, 80 grams 
is not 1.6 grams per kg unless you weigh like, I mean, I can't do the math, but that's, that's light. You know, if you, you have to divide that by 0.7 to figure out what your body weight is. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're like, unless you're a buck 20, I don't think that's an appropriate, you know, protein intake. Right. Um, and even then it's four grams short. I think maybe 80, you need, if you're a buck 20, the lowest your protein should be is, is 84 grams, I think. Um, so anyway, but uh, that's 0.7 grams per pound. Anyway, without me doing math live on the air, I, it's, oh, this is going to be a much more interesting conversation. Under 14. I was way off. See, look at that. So no, if you're 120, 120 pounds. Or let's see, if you take 80. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing this, folks. Yeah. We're doing the math. We're so if you're 120 utilize. pounds divided by 2.2, that means you're 54 kilos. Okay. 54.5 times 1.6, 87 grams of protein. Okay. So if you are, yeah, yeah I was going uh, the other way from 80, but yeah. yeah. So if, if you are 120 pounds, this is still slightly too low of protein to take <laughs> for you. Um, so it's just not realistic. So that that's one thing is that in, in a real world example, you're eating 50% more protein than this on average, right? Um, and you're going to be eating carbohydrates and fat. So, you know, lipids, fiber, uh, and fluids that you're consuming ad libitum during this period. And the fact that you're not coming, you're, you're, this is a fasted, you know, it's an artificial, artificial condition. So if you're not fasted in the first place and you're consuming other foods, all of a sudden these peaks and valleys of digestion of whey, and you're not consuming whey as your only protein source become these, you know, very homogenous hills and, and, and little mini valleys. Uh, instead of these, you know, sharp crevasses. So essentially, you're almost always in the postprandial state. You're always in, a, in, a, in the presence of amino acids being digested, uh, except maybe first thing in the morning in the real world. Mm -hmm. So how much does speed matter? Probably very little. And uh, another way of looking at this is that when we there's a there's a cool systematic review where they compared. Uh, body composition outcomes in studies where they added protein uh, between meals or protein with meals. And these are common things that you'll see in some of the body recomposition or weight control research is they'll give people, because it's a much easier thing to do than you know manipulate their nutrition entirely, is, okay, you eat three meals a day. That's what you normally do. Awesome. We want to get your protein intake up and see what that does independently as an effect on your body composition. All right. With each one of your meals, have a protein shake or between each one of those meals have a protein shake. Mm -hmm. And you would think given that three doses of protein per day should be less than what is optimal based on Arita and colleagues, that the studies where they gave protein between meals should enhance body composition more, but the systematic review didn't find any differences in terms of the effects. They were quite similar. The same, similar number of studies found positive effects for both or, or very similar effects. So the, the applied data doesn't match it. Um, and again, we also have other applied data. So we have some data on different forms of uh, time-restricted feeding or what the internet calls intermittent fasting, uh, where if you're consuming all of your meals in an eight-hour window uh, and have three at least, and you train during that, that state as well, it seems to produce very similar outcomes to having a more traditional meal schedule. Is it optimal long-term? Some data would suggest probably not, but it's, it's not gonna make a huge difference and so long as you're consuming sufficient protein. So we have from the time-restricted feeding, we have the added uh, supplements in the uh, protein shake systematic review. Um, and then we just generally have kind of our understanding of protein digestion speeds, which all suggest it probably doesn't matter unless you're really restricting your feeding window, which you probably shouldn't do in the first place. Yeah, no, that's great to know. And I think, again, another point that I think will be reassuring for people where, yeah, like you don't need to be worrying about like, these aren't lab conditions where you're in a vacuum with nothing else in your system, um, yeah. but this 20 grams of whey. So yeah, shout out to Eric for distilling all this protein research, showing us the way. In terms of actual supplements, People perseverate a lot about, you know, like the different, all the different kinds of protein supplements out there. Is there any practical difference? Uh, probably not, you know, based on everything that we, we've talked about, you know, one other area on the protein timing and the digestion speed mm -hmm. that comes up is the, uh, the pre-bid casing, right? Hey, I mean, Hey, you know, Eric just said the only time I'm not postprandial is that first thing in the morning after I've been asleep for eight hours and, you know, I had my last meal two hours before I went to bed. Why not, you know, take 
30 minutes right before I go to bed, you know, uh, some, some, some casein and, and, and have that, that slower digesting protein that will, you know, prevent me from being in that, that state where I actually haven't had amino acids for, for eight to 10 hours. And that's something bodybuilders have done for a long time based upon that, you know, mechanistic understanding, but it's only been recently studied in the last half decade. And the only time that we've actually seen a benefit from doing that, and I think of them aware of like four or five studies, uh, is where the one group gets added protein and the other group gets added placebo, so like maltodextrin, right? And what and, and and there now the question is, all right, well, this group had a total of 1.9 grams per kg of protein because they had this 40 gram casein shake before bed. This other group only had 1.4 or 1.3 because they had maltodextrin before bed. So are we observing a difference because they had that protein before bed or are we observing a difference because one group had 1.9 and one had 1.4? Mm. So we can't know the difference in those studies, but there are two studies, uh, one by, I believe, Antonio and one by Joy, where they controlled for this. So they gave both groups this 40 gram-ish, you know, whey protein shake, uh, sorry, uh, casein protein shake or 30 gram, I can't remember. It might be different in the two studies, but one did it earlier in the day and one did it right before bed. And in those cases, we didn't see any significant differences between groups. That's only two studies. Um, and I could see a theoretical rationale for, for, for maybe it not being a bad idea. And my general recommendation for bodybuilders is to have a non whey protein source, just so it's not a fast digesting source as your last meal of the day, but just to kind of cover that base. But I have literally zero empirical data to suggest that will be better. It's just something that is a no potential downside and not enough data for me to be confident to say that it couldn't have a benefit. So why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's another, you know, cool thing to point out when we're talking about nutrition and these things. And that's the beauty of bodybuilding, you know, where like these things, it doesn't cost anything to just like rearrange when you're eating, eating certain things. And, and it's really not hard to make a couple small modifications into your, into your lifestyle and just make it habit and mm -hmm. checking off all the boxes. So, yeah, I think that's been a great talk. I think we'll, we should probably wind it down because this is going to go far, too far down the rabbit hole if we continue, but we'll carry on next time. This has been great, Eric, and we're lucky to have him on the show, especially since Eric has been intimately associated and involved in protein research and all this. So good to have you back. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And it's been a good discussion. Yeah. So I will link Eric's uh, IG and 3DMJ and it shout you out in the description below and thanks again for being on the show thank you very much man talk to you soon